And for this talk, we have Chloe, and Chloe is going to talk to us about floating the goat, how to use DevSecOps to secure OWASP web goat. Take it away. Chloe. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. I'm super excited to be here. It's my first time in Vegas, first time at the Diana Initiative. Uh, so something I've been really looking forward to. And also after a bunch of years of listening and watching a lot of talks, the first thing I was aware of is not only did I need to have a good enough idea, but I also needed a witty name. So obviously I was thinking of some good goat memes, goat ideas, and floating the goat just made the most sense. Um, so yeah, so today we're gonna talk about how to use DevSecOps to secure OWASP web goat. And just to walk through our agenda, obviously we'll start out with introductions, what makes me even qualified to talk about this stuff. And then we're gonna hit a lot of um, really uh, not, not really hardy topics. We're, you know, we're gonna define web application security, CICDs, DevSecOps, cloud security, open source, OWASP web goat, and then wrap it all up with leading the change. So we're gonna rapid fire through a lot of high level overviews. I do wanna preface, all these topics can be a course, a textbook, a lecture in itself. I instead want to define it and move on and kind of just paint the picture, set the stage. Uh, then we're gonna do a demo. It's actually not gonna be a live demo just by virtue of not having enough time to troubleshoot, but basically I'm gonna walk us through how in theory we would go ahead and float the goat and wrap up with some lessons learned, next steps, questions, shout outs, resources, and appendix. So overall, this is meant to be a super high level, sort of like one inch deep talk where we talk about DevSecOps overall, best practices, and some practical first steps for creating your own demo to pilot yourself. Because the best way to learn anything is to try it yourself. I've read, I've, I've read plenty about DevSecOps. I've honestly scored the, scored the internet trying to get up to speed on the latest with a bunch of different white papers, but definitely getting my hands wet and building out this pipeline, troubleshooting it myself, I was able to really get a really close look at how challenging it honestly is to make sure that you have a secure software development lifecycle from end to end. Okay, so about myself. Yes, hi, I'm Chloe. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a cybersecurity engineer. I wouldn't really have been here today if it wasn't for my parents putting me in computer class back in the 90s. And then 20 years later, it ended up being my career, which I'm so thankful for. Um, I got my master's and undergrad from Fordham University in the Bronx, New York. Um, and then I started my career out in, at Deloitte doing cyber risk consulting, where I learned, first of all, what even consulting is. I didn't know what consulting was. I went to business school, I heard that term a lot, and I went ahead and started my career with only a vague understanding of what, why I was being sent around the country to talk to people about things. But that's what happens when you have 22-year-olds <laughs> be consultants. Um, so I was really dumb for a bunch of years and then I left Deloitte a little less dumb and I moved over to industry. So in addition to my work today, I also teach an intro to cybersecurity class for a nonprofit based in St. Louis called Savvy Coders. And it's a really great program and it helps with career transitioners and mainly veterans try to pivot into cybersecurity. And also because they're veterans, they have so many applicable like life experience and work background that does directly apply to cybersecurity. So it's been really rewarding, honestly hearing about their experiences and also just translating that into cybersecurity. Uh, so yeah, while at Deloitte, I mainly worked in application security and DevSecOps. And previously I've also done security architecture, but today I'm working on endpoint security. So diving right into it. Um, what is application security? Like I said, all these topics can be an entire course lecture in itself. And honestly, hearing Tanya's keynote this morning really was a great way to like kick it off in my head for sure. But to define application security, it's the use of software, hardware, and methods to protect applications from external threats, something that you know, brought all of us here today. And I even went ahead after hearing Tanya speak, I was like, I wanna hear her definition. Um, and she also defines AppSec to be every action you take towards ensuring the software that you or someone else creates is secure. I would say pretty straightforward. 
So in general, when it comes to application security, there's a ton of terms, phrases that you hear associated. And one that I feel like we've beat the dead horse on a little bit is this idea of shifting left. And shifting left is just the idea of incorporating security earlier in, in the pipeline, in the software development life cycle, what have you. And it's this idea of finding and fixing vulnerabilities earlier. So it's this approach of building security um, into your DevOps versus having it be an afterthought. And as we all know, doing security retroactively, it's a pain. Um, <laughs> fixing, fixing things that are broken, it's a pain. It takes a really long time versus putting something out that's secure. Um, it takes time to get to, to develop the process to put something out securely. But once you do, it is, it is a process that you could further iterate on, build off of, and um, continue to grow. But in general, I would say application security, it needs that transformation. And it's not really possible without a culture at an organization that's very security focused, without you know, awareness, without training, and without enabling developers to feel empowered to include security in their day-to-day -day work. I kind of already touched on what is DevSecOps, but again, it's just the concept of security in every phase of the de DevOps lifecycle. So it's a strategic and continual improvement process aimed at delivering continuous security, efficiency, product quality, and also in, uh, assists with collaboration and reduced costs. So while there's also a real benefit to just having a more secure DevOps process, a more secure DevSecOps process, there's also a direct business case to why you want um, your, your DevOps, your soft, secure software development lifecycle to be secure from the get-go. Um, so integrating, uh, let's see. And also, just to backtrack a little bit, um, how do we even get to DevOps? How do we even get to DevSecOps? And it kind of started out with this idea of these monolithic, huge, scary applications. Enormous, there was everything, everything going on at once. One thing broke, it took the whole thing down. It was really hard to change, to iterate, to build off of, and it just turned into these colossal, like legacy, monolithic applications. Um, that wasn't really helpful in the long run, so there was kind of a move to microservices, and from microservices, we were able to better develop DevOps, Agile, Scrum, and this idea of, again, incorporating more security into the mix. What else? But yeah, just again, want to hit on how like DevSecOps really drives business success and the, ben the benefits overall extends to the entirety of an organization, the team, what have you. All right, moving on to CICD pipeline. So CI CICD stands for Continuous Integration, Continuous Delivery. Um, and they are really susceptible to attacks and exploits. Some that I could think of off the top of my head include stealing API keys, making unauthorized commits, executing Nmap scans, breaking out of a command line, um, command shell, all things that obviously we would like to avoid. So each pipeline is dedicated to a specific process that is tailored to whatever feature, product, artifact that's being produced. There really is no one size fits all solution when it comes to what a CI CD pipeline should look like, what your testing should look like, what have you. Again, as I mentioned, it's really this iterative process. All right, moving on, cloud security, or as I like to call it, let's have someone else um, manage your data center. Um, cloud security has been, been around for a while. And at this point, I think we're all really familiar with the major players that include AWS, which I'm gonna be talking about more so today, um, Azure, GCP, what have you. So strong cloud and application security really starts during development. And it's really important to just, again, continue to shift cloud security left with automated tools and just starting from the beginning with securing the cloud environment. And I also want to touch on that there's this shared responsibility model. You're given for what, whatever you want to pay. You're able to configure your cloud environment as you need it, but it's up to you to harden your infrastructure, secure your CI/CD pipeline, make sure you don't expose 
um, any secrets in plain text. Um, I remember how just concerns with having public S3 buckets with sensitive information is just something that has happened and will probably continue to happen because there is this shared responsibility model when it comes to cloud security. All right. And then also containers, again, another thing that's been around for a while, they're super helpful with development, um, being able to pull something up really quickly. It's something I used when I was trying to pull up um, WebGoat. So containers um, can be built and shipped through the CI CD. So you pull images from Registry or you could check it out um, from Dockerfile and build and package new images. You could push new images, tear them up, tear them down, really, really helpful. Um, but I also want to flag that containers can also, of course, have security vulnerabilities. Introducing any new tool, any new process, any new thing introduces risk to any environment, any pipeline, what have you. So just being cognizant of the risk that you're um, further inviting is really important. And also thinking through controls and mitigations is really important. Uh, open source, we're all super familiar with open source. Lots of pros, lots of cons. Pros, of course, I would say the big one is normally it's free. Of course, there's a donation aspect to it. Um, and there's a lot to pull from. But there, in addition, there's also enterprise software where um, the con is, or one of the cons can be, that it's more expensive, you have to pay for it, but you do have a support team, um, customer service that you don't, you don't necessarily have guaranteed for free services. Um, when it comes to DevSecOps, when it comes to application security, it is a very tool heavy um, space in general. I, throughout my research for all this, I encountered hundreds of different tools, enterprise, open source, what have you. I initially wanted to include a list of great tools, but I just threw it into the appendix because it just got really unwieldy. But I think it's really important to be really familiar with a bunch of open source tools, enterprise tools, and not really focus your attention on one or the other, or just like a suite of products that maybe like one enterprise company creates. It really is a matter of what makes the most sense um, for your team, cost-wise, use case-wise, what have you. All right, and now finally, where does floating the goat come from? OWASP web goat. So OWASP web goat is kind of, it's actually, is a project that comes out of OWASP, the Open Worldwide Application Security Project. I think we're all fairly familiar with it. Um, they have a bunch of chapters, they have a ton of different projects, and they're a really great organization. One thing that I always think of when I hear OWASP is their OWASP top 10 web application vulnerabilities. And they built an intentionally insecure application called OWASP WebGoat for folks to learn how to hack, get familiar with the OWASP top 10, and have a, like, a safe space to really learn how to work through them for Java, for um, web vulnerabilities in Java-based applications. So the reason, why it, it's, the reason why I wanted to use WebGo, it's something I've used for years, I've taught for years, and I kind of like the idea of, okay, what if I took this intentionally like, insecure app and tried to like, build some automated testing around it? What if I tried to um, hook it up to some logging? What if I tried to threat model it? And that's where kind of the origin of this idea really came from. And then leading the change. So as all our badges said, the theme of this year's Diana initiative is leading the change. The reason why I thought talking about DevSecOps, while it's buzzy, it's been buzzy for a while, um, it all ties back to the importance of making sure that you're leading the change within your organization, within your team, to incorporate security and make sure that um, you also recognize that it, it's iterative. It's not overnight. And it's just something that you could bring to your org and also do uh, work on, on yourself. But I, again, I want to encourage, empower, and discuss ways that you as an individual can just assist with leading the change and promoting a more security-focused culture and incorporate using DevSecOps. All right, so this is what a baseline I wanted to use for a very idealized and super mature DevSecOps end-to-end -end pipeline. Is this realistic? Is this exhaustive? Is this every single process that should be involved from the pipeline from end to end? No. But 
throughout my research, I thought these made the most sense to call out for the purpose of this presentation. So, and also another thing I wanna call out, it's this continuous integration. DevOps is just continuously going um, from new feature to pushing into production and starting all over again. It's iterative, it's not really just this line, but again, just visually, this is how I wanted to present it. So when it comes to securing the pipeline from end to end, uh, we started with a new feature. We have a new feature, we have a new API, we wanna use this new integration, awesome. Okay, let's, let's talk about what the security architecture and design of this is. Um, all right, we have this little web architecture diagram. What if we threat model? What are the threats associated? What are some controls and mitigations we could discuss? From there, again, it would probably involve going back to the design, redesigning it, incorporating more security. And from there, we're like, okay, let's talk about some static um, testing. Let's talk about some dynamic testing, some interactive testing, automated testing, tons of testing. Um, of course, we want to do third-party component scanning. Um, look for just really big glaring um, third-party components that have known vulnerabilities like Heartbleed or Log4j. Um, repo scanning, really important. Um, just having your uh, just having any secrets or what have you in plain text is to be avoided. Um, pen testing, this is more of a manual process. And same, same thing, you have something that's been through a lot of testing, been through threat modeling, been through security architecture and design, and you have, a, um, you have someone go ahead and test it um, in a more real life way. From there, we got approval for release and then this continuous logging and monitoring. Uh, so yeah, like I mentioned before, throughout the, this pipeline, there is a huge quantity of different tools, upscaling and culture needed. There's also concerns with tools drift, configuration drift, um, and also like tools that might not have really natural integrations with each other that you might have to workshop around, build around, what have you. Um, and also a couple of things that I didn't include, but of course I wanna call out because they are really important. But again, for the sake of this presentation, I just didn't um, include it for now. But some other things that I think are important to mention are, is the secrets management, infrastructure as code, and policy as code. Um, policy as code was something that I wasn't super familiar with. And really, like looking more into it, I thought it was really interesting. It's just this idea of automating GRC. And instead of having GRC be a little more manual, it's something that's automated. All right, so let's go ahead and zoom in on the pipeline. I kind of called out this beginning piece where we got the new feature and now we're moving into security architecture and design. Um, so high level, I'm like, okay, I want to use OWASP WebGo. It's a Java-based application. What's the easiest way to access it? Um, I could set it up locally or I could use AWS. Why don't I use AWS? I haven't. I haven't honestly used it on my day to day for like a year or two, so I thought this would be a really good opportunity to just get up to speed with AWS. They're pushing out new stuff constantly. And again, this is just a really good opportunity to just get your hands wet, get familiar with the latest and greatest. So I'm like, okay, I wanna use AWS. Obviously it makes sense to put it on an EC2 instance. Um, and because it's a web application, maybe I could also use Beanstalk. So these are kind of the thoughts I have when I'm working through this process of security architecture and design. So like I'm talking it through and I wanna look at the setup and requirements to make a preliminary web architecture diagram that we could go ahead and leverage for the next step of threat modeling. Just include some screenshots of the, Git, the GitHub for OWASP WebGoat, the website for OWASP WebGoat, and just like the introduction and next steps. As I mentioned before, I called out containers. I thought that using Docker containers that put it on an EC2 instance on AWS would be the best way to go about this. Um, so yeah, just wanted to include some screenshots of the documentation. So here is my like preliminary web architecture diagram. Is this the best architecture diagram? No, but is it high level kind of what I'm getting at? Yeah, so we have our EC2 instance behind this trust boundary. Um, it's a Maven app, um, and I threw it up using Docker with that backend database. Um, when I was setting it up, I actually went ahead and set it up um, with just 
unencrypted traffic to access it between my web browser and um, the EC2 instance. Just for the sake of, again, the exercise of setting something up really insecurely and being aware that I'm setting something up really insecurely and also knowing how to fix it right away. But again, this is just a preliminary web architecture diagram, right? So we have that. Um, I already called out some concerns with it, but let's go ahead and threat model. Um, going back to OWASP, it is, um, going back to OWASP, they have a bunch of great products um, and projects, including this one called OWASP Th Threat Dragon. Um, so I wanna use it for a threat modeling. And I was going, I was reading like a SANS white paper where they had some high level questions that they wanted to include or, or good guiding questions when it comes to threat modeling. So um, are you changing the attack service? Are you changing the technology stack? Are you adding any confidential or sensitive data and have threat agents changed? So include some screenshots of what OWASP Threat Dragon looks like, a bit of details, a cute little um, GUI that you could interact with. So basically, you could download it and this is how it looks like, the orange piece over here. And from there, you could build out a web architecture diagram, you could threat model, you could add severity ratings to it, and it actually leverages the Microsoft Stride um, threat model framework. And Stride stands for um, like spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, um, what else? Elevation of privilege, denial of service, what have you. So once, once you go ahead, threat model using OWASP Threat Dragon, they actually give you either JSON or a PDF file where it gives you this executive summary with a summary um, and also lists out all your different threats and descriptions on the threats and their mitigations. So this is what my threat model kind of looks like, where I called out concerns with spoofing, repudiation, tampering for, of course, the EC2 instance, the unencrypted web traffic, and yeah. And then the mitigations I called out in this chart here. And again, I had an idea of where I wanted to bring this, so I really one for one had the threats um, map out to a couple things I wanted to do th for the, throughout the course of this presentation, which is using um, Zap and CloudWatch. So Zap is something I'll talk about in a little bit, and same thing with CloudWatch. But when it comes to information disclosure, because there is a lack of auditing and logging, a real cl clear fix for that would be to incorporate <laughs> logging and monitoring, which would be through CloudWatch, similar with incorporating Zap for testing for sensitive data exposure. So here are the mitigations that came from the threat model or um, that build into the web architecture diagram where we have this initial diagram that we saw and then we included um, the mitigations of logging, having a automated um, server like GitLab and have dynamic scanning with Zap. So, okay, bringing back to the pipeline, we're talking about securing it from end to end um, and I kind of like to think of it in three different phases where you have this design ideation phase, the continuous integration and delivery, and then operations. Again, I kind of wanted to focus on the security architecture, threat modeling, DAST, and continuous logging and monitoring. And pulling from the threat model, we have these identified challenges and risks where we have security flaws in the design of the architecture and the application. We have concerns with slow and efficient and insecure deployment. We have, we have blatant security flaws in the source code itself, again, because it is a intentionally wet, uh, vulnerable web application. And then there's this lack of vis visibility where you really don't have any idea what's going on. We don't know who's logging in. We don't have any logs. Um, and then our processes to mitigate is the dynamic scanning, the logging, the design aspect, what have you. So pulling that back, this is what we're gonna zoom in on for the rest of this, and then we're going into the demo. Um, is, it five, is that five minutes left? Okay. So I'm gonna have to speed through this, but um, I wanna call out that because it's floating the GOAT, it is, I wanted to pull up some GOAT memes. Sorry for the lack of cat memes. This was funny on Twitter for one day where they were joking about goats licking salt walls. 
But basically, I'm going to fly through the remainder of this development, um, these slides. But basically, what you would go ahead is you set up the development environment, included all the steps to set up the AWS account, EC2 instance, update, pull up Docker, access WebGo. And then some screenshots on what the EC2 dashboard looks like, WebGoat, and um, once it's back up. All right, moving on to the CI CD. We want to set up GitLab. Again, we're going to zoom through. We're setting up GitLab. We have all the steps where we're installing, adding the packages, and what have you. So we'll pause on GitLab and bring that back up once we set up our dynamic scanning with Zap. Um, of course, actually, this is, never mind. I was just going to say this is another meme of, from a, a goat from a Taylor Swift video. But um, <laughs> when it comes to DAS, I, want to, I wanted to, again, use a tool that, its purpose is for pen testing, but I was like, no, I want to use it for di dynamic scanning because you can set it up for automated dynamic scanning. I also want to call out, it is no longer OWASP Zap. It is Zap as of this week. They're moving away from OWASP. Um, yeah, that was news to me too. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's what I thought. <laughs> Excuse me? Yes, it's still open source. It's just it moved away from OWASP. Um, so yes, again, um, to authenticate, okay, and then including steps on how to access Zap, how to set it up, um, you want to add your WebGo URL as, um, as its target, and then also you want to go ahead and record a authentication script using this built-in tool within Zap called Zest, where once you have this automated um, scanning, testing, what have you, you need to make sure that I could access the web application and authenticate to it, so you have to just add this as a preliminary step. Um, and then from there, to just continue the automate the scan with Zap, you want to actually go ahead and use the Zap API, create a script to automate the scans, and then next steps would be to trigger those automated scans as part of the acceptance test, run the CI/CD pipeline, and review the results. So that's what we're kind of seeing on the right side with this little diagram, where we got our EC2 instance, we got the GitLab server, and then it's also hooked up to Zap. Um, and then coming to the logging. Since it's already on AWS, AWS has a million different tools. One that we all know and have worked with is CloudWatch. Um, I ran out of goat meme ideas, so I just Googled sassy goat, and this is what I got. <laughs> so to implement CloudWatch monitoring for an EC2 instance, you just want to connect the instance. We got some commands you run once you're on that EC2 instance. You actually want to go ahead and include um, and create some IAM roles to be able to access it. Um, you copy access key ID, paste it in the CLI. Um, and yeah, again, included all the steps that you would need to implement CloudWatch on that EC2 instance. So bringing it all together for that CI, CI CD delivery, Back to the GitLab server, we want to connect the GitLab server to the automated scans and the continuous logging. So we got the GitLab server on an EC2 instance. You want to go ahead and install and configure a GitLab runner and create another IAM role where it would allow that server to be able to access it. Um, from there, you would create a scanning script utilizing that Zap API and then this is where you would do that further configuration, where you would configure the GitLab CI/CD pipeline, you would register the EC2 instance as a GitLab runner, and then test the setup. So again, this is just our EC2 instance connected to CloudWatch for logging and the GitLab server to actually do that automated process. Um, I ran through this because I thought I only had five minutes left, and now I have 30 minutes left. But I have a lot to say about cont um, continuous improvements and lessons learned. Um, I will first of all say um, lessons learned. Really great and valuable experience to give yourself the opportunity to try something out, to pilot something out, to automate it and mess around with it. And also try to be like, okay, I, I really want to learn how to use this tool and I want to figure out how to hook it up to this other tool. It's, it's just there's so much value in being able to manually do it versus 
in theory, understanding how to do something. In theory, understanding how to do something is very different from actually doing that thing. Um, while I was working through creating this whole presentation, I definitely tried to scale back, like ramp up, went back and forth about what I wanted to include. And definitely, it's just when you have a time constraint in mind, just be aware of don't bite off more than you could chew. That's just me saying this out loud for myself. Um, definitely overestimate and buffer in more troubleshooting time than anticipated, especially if it's in the summer. Um, as I said before, this pipeline is not exhaust exhaustive. There's always so much more to add. Um, go ahead and go through the exercise of building out that web architecture diagram and try to figure out what other tools you want to utilize. Threat model and focus in on different things to learn and incorporate. And there's a ton of different things that I had already been working through in my head that I thought would be really fun to work through. When it comes to AWS, um, even just setting up the EC2 instances, I set them up fairly insecurely. So of course, going ahead, locking down using security groups with um, more restrictive inbound rules, IAM rules, a restrictive VPC. I already mentioned how I wanted to use Beanstalk, definitely try to attempt that again, or even use EKS. And then when it comes to CloudWatch, once you like integrate it, it's also great, you really want to include alerts, you want to building alerts, and you could also utilize CloudFormation to trigger setup. And then, as I mentioned before, WebGoat is just one of a bunch of vulnerable web applications that you could utilize. You could try to do this with OWASP Juice Shop, AWS Go, and Dan Vulnerable Web App. Um, you could also try using this on different cloud platforms like Azure and GCP. Again, it's really important just to make sure you have familiarity with a bunch of different cloud um, platforms. AWS, while they do have um, a huge majority of the cloud environment, um, marketplace in general, GCP and Azure, and even Oracle, Salesforce, they all have different cloud um, environments that are really worth poking around and getting familiar with. Um, and then some other, like, and beyond. I already called out how I'd want to, like, poke more around with policy as code, secrets management, third-party component scanning. But um, as I was doing my research, I, get, I was reading a ton of white papers coming out of GitLab, and they had a really interesting um, survey that came out this year, the 2023 Global DevSecOps Report Security Without Sacrifices. Um, I thought it was a really great way to get a good pulse check on what's going on, what are developers thinking, and where are we moving towards. So one quote that stood out to me is that our 2023 survey findings show that a DevSecOps platform could help by allowing organizations to boost security without sec sacrificing efficiency. So it's this idea of we want security, but we also very much want um, efficiency. Um, and we want efficiency that's also really cost efficient because we don't want to buy a ton of different tools that don't work um, and we don't know how to use. Also, as I mentioned before, there's just so many tools in general and there is the survey was talking about how there is a general like fatigue with just the amount of too many security tools. Um, and the big thing, of course, is AI. It's just something that we as, as um, an industry is reckoning with, but also globally, every industry is reckoning with what the future of AI is kind of going to look like. But the survey had a really positive light when it came to AI and DevSecOps, and they really were talking about how it's really inseparable, um, and it's actually a really good opportunity to take full advantage of AI, it'll be critical to help with just um, automating faster, um, and helping with a bunch of different things that would be really handy. But, um, yeah, like there, it, there was even this quote that AI and ML are becoming well-established in software development workflows today, and. I can only imagine it will only continue to do so. Um, so just being familiar with how to better incorporate it in your DevSecOps pipeline is super important. So that's all I have. Um, again, I kind of sped through the middle of it because I thought I had 30 minutes for a second, but then I don't. So I do believe that we have quite a bit of time left. If anyone has any questions or any feedback or anything you'd want to bring up or discuss, yes. <laughs> Yes, 
Yeah, I mean, I think I kind of, the, that was kind of my leading question when I came up, when I came up with this talk in general. It's like, what, what's feasible? What are low-hanging fruits you could grab off of? What can you build off from? And it's just this iterative process where it's like, okay, let's focus on the quick wins. Let's focus on what makes the most sense for right now and continue to build off of that. Because this isn't exhaustive, this isn't finite, and it will continue to develop as your org, your team, and also whatever you want to explore continue, continues to develop. Yeah. Uh, in your experience, uh, who's responsible of implementing this pipeline? Because you, you mentioned a lot of activities that block a tester, a code reviewer, Yeah, 100%. Everything you mentioned, yeah, it does require a lot of cross-team coordination. When I was thinking this through, initially I was thinking just a, develop, um, a development team in conjunction with a security team, but all these activities are an entire team in itself, a whole department in itself. Security architecture and threat modeling is a whole department. Um, just managing these tools as a whole department, doing application scanning in general, triaging those results is something that a security team could do and then hand it over to the developers to go ahead and action on. Um, so yeah, in general, it requires a lot of people, it requires a lot of buy-in from executive leadership and from developers and the security team. So it's just a lot of players in action. So that's why I wanted to call out that this is really challenging. It's not something that could be done overnight. This is just something that honestly sounds like a multi-month, multi-year um, process, but making sure that security is, and the security team, people, what have you, are seen as allies and folks who want to help you, not folks who want to stop developers and stop um, the business from making money, new products getting out, what have you. Yeah? I off my oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think your point about how this could be um, pointed out from application testing, pen testing in general is really important. I think just making sure that butts are covered, everything is covered, when, and having it called out individually made sense for me when I was coming up with all this. But um, I definitely agree that having it be its own thing is just maybe it just making triple sure that it's covered, but. I don't know if I have a really good answer to that other than really good point. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, I think that's a big, it depends. Um, dependency stuff, that's a whole other ballgame in itself. Um, that's a really good point. That's something I definitely didn't touch on. But thinking back on it now, yeah, 100%. That's what makes all this so complicated and so interwoven and requires so much buy-in from you know, the collaboration between so many cross-collaborative teams. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer to that either, other than it. Um, is definitely something to be aware of and something that needs to be incorporated for sure. Yeah, no, it was such a great tool because I, again, I wanted to make sure that I was showing a bunch of different enterprise and open source tools that was like, one of my other little visions, and I love OWASP. I wanted to use all OWASP open source tools, but Zap had a different um, plan in mind when they decided they were pulling off of OWASP this, um, this week, but that's a total aside. But, sorry, to very tediously go all the way back to the Threat Dragon slides. But um, it's a great little tool. 
I included the link in the resources and I'll also give a link to my, my slides itself because I included a lot of notes in the resources and appendix where I even like spell out what Stride even is. Um, but it's such a great tool. Just, you could just go ahead and look up OWASP Threat Dragon and it has details on how to install it on your desktop for Mac, Windows, what have you. And also it's on GitHub as well. And this is what the GUI looks like. And when you access it, you can, uh, you could even like base your architecture diagram off of an existing template they have. You could build one yourself. It has like clickable um, little, t little like boxes and squares where you could call out um, actors and processes and then connect the web flow. And it was a great little tool. It really took me not very long to get up to speed on. Because again, when I was going through this, I kept um, rabbit holing myself a lot into just, oh, connecting this to that, this new tool, what have you. But this was really, really quick to get up to speed. Great tool. You can install it. And it was great to just mess around. And then also, it produces this great little PDF um, that you could utilize with this executive summary and just details on like um, the type, the title, the priority, um, description, and mitigations. And I didn't go as deep on this and as comprehensive on the threat modeling as I could have, but this is, again, like a whole great project that you could really dive into and highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, th that's a good question. I would have, you know, you could threat model, like you could on a white piece of paper, you could threat model on a PowerPoint, you could create a little diagram wherever. It was just really nice that it was all there. It had a nice little GUI I could use. It could produce a little report. And it also used the Stride um, threat modeling framework, which I had heard of before, I never really used before. And I really liked it for its simplicity, where it just focused on the sixth, um, these six threats where, you know, every threat modeling framework has its pluses and minuses. Do I think that all threats fall under only spoofing, radiation, information disclosure, tampering DOS, elevation of privilege? No, but that's what other frameworks are for that you could also utilize. Yes. Um, the column headers, um, I could kind of zoom in, actually I can't zoom in, but um, like it would be each of the individual um, assets that I was uh, put associating a threat to. If you go back to the next, for the right column. So these would be my assets, these would be the threats, this would be the descriptions for each of the threats, and then these would be the mitigations for each threat. And then the, it, like the mitigations include, you know, authentication, authorization, communication security, auditing and logging, um, exception management, session management. So a bunch of things that I one for one mapped up to DAST and logging. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, there's a ton, there's a ton. Um, just when it comes to Stride itself, you could just look up Stride threat modeling and Microsoft has a ton of documentation on it. Um, but basically all OWASP Threat Dragon is just like a little web application that you could create a threat, um, a threat model on and you could look up different threats and you're using the Stride um, threat model or, or framework to do your threat model on. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for all your questions. Um, really grateful for this opportunity to be here. This is my first time. If you couldn't tell, this was my first time ever giving a security talk IRL. Um, <laughs> um, and in a mask, too. So, yeah, super happy to be here. I'll be around, bopping around. But thank you, everyone, for your time today.